Okay, you can hear me. Cool. Um, well, it's, it's always kind of nice to uh, close an evening. Um, I have a very different story. I'm not talking about uh, technology. I'm not talking about cell phones at all. I'm going to share with you two stories, two very related stories, two things that I did the past few years. They're both about bringing culture to barren volcanic landscapes on two volcanoes on the other side of the world. Let me start with this one. This is a shot I made when I was walking on the, when I was walking on the Merapi volcano in Jakarta. I was invited by a local group of artists to do an art project there, an artist residency. And they were based in Jakarta, and Merapi is really close to, to the city. And just a few months before I arrived, there was this huge eruption that happened. Villages got destroyed, meters of ash got distributed. And I was really interested to see how, as an artist, I could somehow tap into that. Uh, in, in Whoops. So anyway, where was I? So, got really interested in a volcano. I never had done anything on a volcano. I hardly knew anything about volcanoes. Now, what is typical, what you could see in this slide is that there is no vegetation. Why is there no vegetation in these, in these landscapes? Well, the thing is, the problem is that in this ash, geologically, there is no nitrogen. And nitrogen is really a core element that every single plant needs to grow. So it's dead and it remains dead for a very long time. It slowly regenerates. So I thought maybe we can use science fiction as an inspiration to do something about this. And this is the phenomenon, the idea, the concept of terraforming basically become, became the core inspiration for my project. I'm not sure that everybody knows what terraforming is. People that play computer games, people that read science fiction, they know pr perfectly well what terraforming is. But the idea of terraforming, it's m most often applied to Mars, is you have a dead planet and you bring life to it. And you use all different kinds of techniques to modify the entire climate of a planet. For example, for Mars, some scientists are proposing to put mirrors above the poles of Mars that would beam sunlight onto the poles, evaporate the water, the water would generate a greenhouse effect, and slowly Mars would become habitable. So that's this kind of idea, that's terraforming. So how on earth would you terraform a volcano in Indonesia? How would you do that, right? Well, luckily, there is this interesting bacteria, which is called rhizobium. They're all over the world. People that are gardening, they know them perfectly well. In Dutch, it's called knolletjes bacterie. It's, um, it's a bacterium that actually lives in the roots of plants. And it's, it does something remarkable, a beautiful phenomenon in biology, which is called symbiosis. It infects the roots of legumes, specific plants, such as beans. And by infecting the roots, the root itself develops a little nodule, a little, a little spherical uh, part of, of tissue. The bacteria will live in the tissue, they will fix the nitrogen in the atmosphere, and they will give it to the plant, and in return, the plant gives nutrients to the bacteria. So it's a collaboration between the, the bacteria and the plant. And this is a very interesting thing for that volcano, because our atmosphere contains lots of nitrogen. So even though there is no nitrogen in the soil, if we could capture the nitrogen from the atmosphere using the bacteria and put it in the soil, problem is solved and we can grow food again in that volcano. And that's actually what we did. Uh, the artists that I worked with had connection with local university and there was a professor already investigating the possibility of this natural phenomenon to, uh, to change the soil after volcanic eruption. So I started community building, and that's what I am. I'm an artist, I'm a scientist, and I'm a community organizer. And I make creative projects mixing art and science with communities all over the world. And this is an example of one of those projects. So the goal was basically, in, in Indonesia, the goal was to build an artwork that at the same time was a scientific experiment. Can we build a structure in the landscape where we would explore this concept that I just explained, almost like building a green tower in the landscape, a tower that would on one hand signify or be a symbol signifying the disaster that happened, but also be a gateway to, the, to a future. And so I started working with uh, architecture students. We started brainstorming how we could build a structure on, on the volcano that we would work with. Um, I took the architecture students to the, micro, to the microbiology lab and showed them 
the world of microbiology and specifically about those rhizobia bacteria so the architects could learn about microbiology and use that knowledge within their architectural designs. So this kind of crossover, I think, is, is uh, very crucial. And then we came up with this proposal. Mind you, I'm not working as an artist with a predefined idea of how something should look like and then simply looking for people to help me to build it. No, I have a broad idea. I go to a place and I invite a community to, to work with me together and to shape the idea. So it's really co-creation that we do. So this was the, the, the concluding proposal, a structure out of bamboo and with multiple terraces and on the terraces we would be able to run microbiology experiments. And that's what we did. There's a whole, st I can talk for hours about this project because many different things happened, of course. I'm just briefly summarizing what we did. We built a structure, we brought bamboo up to the volcano, built a structure and started running our own experiments. And yes, indeed, we could uh, grow seeds on that lava soil, as you can see here. We also did different experiments, like for example, transplanting plants for, from unaffected areas and bringing them into the artwork. And this is the, the, commute, the family I was living with at the foot of the volcano. And there's an interesting little story. The eldest son of this family, after I was away, built his own experiment in his own garden, basically replicating the larger structure that we built. So that really was a beautiful example of how the ideas started penetrating the local community. Now, a few things that I learned, a few lessons that I learned, and I need to hurry up because I see the time is going really fast. Um, negotiating in a different culture is a, an incredible learning experience. As a European, as a Western person, um, we have specific ways of thinking how you should negotiate things. And one of the things we do is when we're in a group, when we disagree with something, we put it on the table or we think like, oh, maybe this is not such a good idea. This is not very accepted in uh, Southeast Asian or Eastern cultures in general. Um, and people are offended when you do that. So at a certain point I was asking like, so how do you guys figure things out? How do you do it if you can never really put something negative on the table? And they answered like, you know, we let things fail. If everybody around the table knows that it's not gonna work, we know it, but we don't put it on the table because it's offensive and it fails and then the next time it'll work. And that's another way of dealing with things, of course. And they're just like, you know, Angela, honestly, our time scale is very different than your European time time scale. So that was one of the things that I learned. The second project that I wanted to talk about is this one. It's called High Seas. High Seas is a space mission. I just come back from uh, Hawaii and I did a mission for NASA there. High Seas is a NASA funded Mars simulation. We did the first mission. It's on the Mauna Loa volcano, which is uh, the biggest volcano in the world. And this volcano, the geology of the volcano is very similar to Mars. The, the actual composition. Also, it's a very isolated, uh, an isolated location, and you can run experiments throughout the whole year. So it's a perfect location to practice life on Mars. We did a first mission of four months. We were with six people from diff with different backgrounds, and me personally, I was the commander of this mission. The landscape looks barren. There is, once again, no life resembling my story from uh, Indonesia. This is how the habitat looked like. It was a single dome with a diameter of about 11 meters, a first floor with common spaces, one lab, small lab, and then a second floor, more like a mezzanine, with a few very small bedrooms that you can see here on the left-hand side. You can see our bedrooms, no windows in the bedroom, just a small room, but quite comfortable. And we had one single porthole. So that was it. And the first month we had no windows. So we lived for a month without any window at all in one single dome with six people. And actually it wasn't that bad. I thought it was gonna be much more difficult but it actually worked out. But I must say, when this photo was taken, that was the first time I could see a sunset again. And it was quite nice after a month. The high seas mission is actually, the first high seas mission was actually a food study. We were investigating how to de develop a different, food, a different food system for future space travel. Um, currently, there are issues with um, astronauts having to eat for a very long time space food. They get a little bored with it, no surprise of course, it's all ready meals. And so one of the things that we were investigating is, can we allow future astronauts to cook their own meals using shelf-stable ingredients? And so that's what we, we've been focusing on. 
But we also did other kinds of research. We did a lot of different types of research, just like astronauts on Mars would do. Uh, and then there were the parties, of course. Parties are also important. Every month we would have a party because another month passed. You need to keep life funny and uh, enjoyable in a, uh, in a situation like this. And then there were the EVAs, you know, going outside, uh, doing exploration, mostly geological exploration, and then wearing a spacesuit simulator. It's a spacesuit, but not really a spacesuit, because a real spacesuit is very expensive. But still, these suits, they give you the idea of what it should be like to be wearing a spacesuit. This is the crew, six people, like I said, different backgrounds. And these are just a few lessons that I learned from this mission. The first one is the enormous impact of autonomy and the crucial role of autonomy for future space exploration. We were actually a crew that got a lot of autonomy, more than is, than is, than is common in space exploration. We, we could make our own meals, like I explained, we were allowed to cook. We were allowed to define our own scientific research, something that never happens in space exploration. Astronauts are usually operators. They do things for other people. Um, we were even uh, allowed to define our own schedule. Once again, not very common in space exploration. So this autonomy is really highly motivating. And at a certain point, I even decided, because I was a commander, to offer my role of, a, of my, uh, my commander role to the crew. I asked, is anybody interested to become the commander here? And four out of the five colleagues were like, yeah, we want to be commander. And so I did this experiment where every single week, part of the week, another crew member would take over the role of commander and I would be just a crew member. And I learned a lot from that. And at the end of the whole mission, my commanding style, my leading style, was basically a combination of things that I picked up from other people. So it was a very interesting experience. Second thing, diversity. Diversity is strength. Diversity is resilience. Absolutely, you need a crew with a good amount of diversity. Um, we had three women, three men, works brilliantly. I, I don't think I would ever want to do a mission with just guys. Working with both genders is so much more interesting because you have all these different perspectives coming in. We had different cultural backgrounds. There was a Russian American, somebody from Puerto Rico, I was Belgian. Uh, American, Canadian, and this re all this mix of skills, cultures, and genders, it makes you really strong as a team. Interestingly enough, we shared, culturally, we shared a Western culture, and that made it more easy for us to communicate. I can imagine if a few of my Indonesian friends would be part of the crew, we would have a bit of a, a different story. And then the last thing is the role of communication, and that brings me a little bit to the theme of today. Um, as a crew commander, I really focused on keeping the communication channels open all the time. I was just aware of it every single day. And there were a few different ways in which I did it. First thing is, I wanted a morning briefing every single day where everybody was just simply sharing what they were planning to do for the day. I also asked people to try and come and work in the common room at least a part of the day. It's very tempting when you're living in a small space like this to, after some time, to go to your own room and stay in your own room. It's very comfortable, you have your privacy, you're not disturbed, you can focus. But if everybody starts doing that, you have a bit of a sad situation where everybody's just working in their room, locked up in a dome, and that's not healthy for the group. So that's one of the things that I was asking people, try to avoid that, right? And every week I would do a sort of group session. We would talk about stuff, what happened during the week. And this really changed uh, the dynamics or, or helped the dynamics of the group. So these are just a few things that I learned during this mission. I'm still, I'm still analyzing what happened during those four months because it's only, it's only over for about six, six weeks now. So all in all, what I tried to share with you were two stories in which I was trying to bring culture and life to dead volcanic landscapes. One in which we brought agriculture and life back to a dead landscape. The other one in which we're practicing how to bring human culture to a, a distant planet. And it's my belief that offering communities, volunteers, astronauts, the possibility to self-define the culture that they're growing and building is a very powerful strategy to build lasting and harmonious life. Thank you.